Heavenly Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for the sweet time of worship and praise. And now, Lord, we thank you for your word speaking to us. We pray your spirit would flow through the pages of your written word and become real and impactful on the pages of our heart. Open our ears, open our eyes, and show us wonderful things in your word today. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, last week we finished up Esther chapter 5. And if you recall, we ended when they're in a bit of an intermission period. You know, kind of an interval. Now, think about this. From Mordecai's perspective, and Esther's, and all of the nation, the plan has been proclaimed to destroy the Jews, and it's in place. Not only that, but the law has been written, which we've seen, in the law of the Medes and the Persians. Once a law is written, signed by the king, it cannot be changed. So in this intermission, the people of God are looking around at the law, which is signed and cannot be changed, at the plan which is put into place and seems to be very doable, profitable for the empire. No reason they wouldn't destroy them, but God. Amen? And so God uses intermissions quite often in our life to say, do you trust me? Because it's easy to trust God when he says, trust me, I am providing for your needs, and they will be there tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. when your mortgage is due at 9.30 a.m. That's really easy to trust God. I will provide for all your needs. Here's the schedule. But what, what if God says, I will provide for your needs, and what we're hoping for is our wants, and God does not give us a schedule? Do we trust him? My wife and I have just come through one of those times when we were looking at a train coming down the track and not knowing if God was going to get off those, us off of those tracks before the train ran us over. And as always, God showed up. Praise God. Because God always shows up. And his plan is always right. I'm reminded of our friends Roy and Celine. Had to go back to China. And our hearts were broken. And we cried. And the situation with their lovely, beautiful daughter didn't know how that was going to work out. Our hearts were broken. Their hearts were broken. There was an intermission when God said, Do you trust me? And then God showed up. Amen. Esther chapter 6 verse 1. God is about to break this intermission, about to break this interval with a strange thing. The simplest thing. Insomnia. Hmm. I hate it when I can't sleep, don't you? I hate it when I lay there at night, my head won't turn off. And I just can't go to I just can't stop. I can't turn it off. I can't go to sleep. And usually I fight through it, and eventually, sometime close to tomorrow, I end up going to sleep. What I should do is just go and pray. So just put my eyes on Christ. I know what I should do, and so do you guys. But there's no pedestals here. Just because I know what to do doesn't mean I'm going to do it every time. That's why we have God's Word. To refresh our memories. Amen. So God is going to use a little bit of insomnia to usher in the next act in his grand play that he's putting on here. Esther 6 verse 1. And that night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles and they were read before the king. Because who in the world would not go to sleep if they brought in the government records and read them out loud to you? Hello. This is, this is the best sleeping pill there ever was. And so they bring in the government records, and they're going to drone the king to sleep. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And you recall, as we discussed, these were officials in his court. They weren't just eunuchs. They were officials. They were high-ranking officials. 
and they were close. They were the doorkeepers. Wouldn't say they were his bodyguards, but they were really close. They had access. They had malice. And they had intent. They were going to kill the king. And Mordecai uncovered the plot, told the king's officials. They squashed the plot. Great. So now it's brought to his attention in the droning of the government records that Mordecai had exposed this plan to the king. Then the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Let's look at this from Mordecai's vantage point. It's been years since Mordecai foiled this plot. What was his reward? What did he get out of it? Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Nada. In fact, he's now condemned to die with the rest of his people. A lot of good it did him to protect the king, huh? Because the king has now ordered his death. Did he say in his heart like we might? If I knew this, I'd have let that dude die. Would have served him right. Don't tell me I'm alone here. But how many times has no good deed gone unpunished to my chagrin and endless grumbling? If I had known this is the way it's going to work out, I wouldn't have done so and so. I wouldn't have been so nice to that dude if I knew this is what he was going to do to me. I wouldn't have been praying for that guy if I knew he was going to get well and cause me all this grief. <laughs> You know, we'll see you later on in the sermon, but Solomon did say there's nothing new under the sun, and there's really not. Human nature is human nature. Our struggle is to become conformed into the image and likeness of Christ because we need to be. Apart from the image and likeness of Christ, we are desperately in need in the image and likeness of Christ. Amen? I didn't have any more polite words to put. So, so that's it. So here's Mordecai. He's in this intermission. He saved, single-handedly saved the king. And now he's condemned to die. Was he grumbly? Was he moany? We don't know. Don't know. Just conjecture. But I can see we don't see that in Scripture. Mordecai asked Esther to appeal to the king for this salvation based on God's faithfulness. Not based upon his work. Not based upon, he didn't go to Esther and say, be sure to tell the king, the king that I saved. Remember, I did that. Save me, king, because I did that. No. He told him to go and appeal to the king. And he told Esther, salvation will come from the Jews from somewhere else if you don't. Faith in God's word. He knew God would save them from somewhere. And it might just be her job to do that. His appeal was based on God's faithfulness, not his, and not his works. You see, biblical giving, our service, our good works, even our life itself, are to be done for Christ to the glory of God the Father. That is our only motivation. What we get for it is not our goal and is not our problem. You see, Mordecai had a bit of a problem. I have done the greatest thing in the service of this kingdom for the king that you can imagine in preserving his life from the plot of his enemies. And I got nothing for it, and now I'm going to die. Mordecai's problem was, what did I get for being faithful to God? But the problem wasn't his to solve. And our problems are not ours to solve. When we serve God faithfully, when we do so biblically, the rewards for that, they'll happen. But when they happen, how they happen, that's not our problem. And it's not our decision. And it's not our calendar. It's not us to do. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you in all the great things you've done. No? No? Nope. Wrong! Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In Matthew 6, starting at verse 2, Therefore, when you do a char charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they might have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, 
they have their reward. You recall last time as we're ending in Esther chapter 5, that's exactly what Haman did. He gathered all his people around, got the cymbals and the gongs, and started beating and banging them. Look at all my greatness. Look at all my wealth. Look at all my kids. Bang, bang, bang. Clang, clang, clang. Me, me, me. Look at me, look at me. Well, assuredly, he had his reward. Continuing in Matthew 6, 3. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. And jumping down to 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What we do for the Lord, what we do for Christ, should be for the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the honor and glory of our Father which is in heaven. Let me tell you, the Bible is very, very crystal clear. What we do for Christ will be rewarded. That's not why we do it, but it will happen. Man will not stop it. Satan will not stop it. The stars and the moon and the sun and the seasons will not stop it. What you do for Jesus Christ will be rewarded. But it will be in his time, in his way, according to his will and for his honor and glory. So praise God, we do have many rewards to look forward to. The greatest of which is, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of of your Lord. Whew. That's going to be awesome. That's going to be awesome. So this intermission is about to be over. And biblically, we don't see that Mordecai was uh, moaning in his interim in the intermission. We see he stood on faith and he appealed to Esther to stand on faith. But still in the eyes of the world, this is a bad, bad, bad time for Mordecai. Hmm. So let's continue in Esther chapter 6, verse 4. So the king is reminded, because he got insomnia, by chance he happened to not be able to sleep that night. That's sarcasm, because chance is not a kosher word, right? By chance the king couldn't sleep. By chance he brought in the endless droning of the government records and by chance they happen to tell of Mordecai's salvation of him and his kingdom and he asked what's been done for this man and they said nothing verse 4 so the king said who's in the court <laughs> now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Now, in our Esther minute that I sent out, I'm probably not going to remember it correctly, but th the definition of irony is a series of events or an event that goes exactly opposite of what you would expect, often with humorous results. And, and I would add to that, see also Esther chapter 6, because there is no greater example of irony in the Bible or in any literature anywhere than right here. Here comes Haman, skipping merrily along, according to the instructions of his wife and his friends and family, build the gallows, go down, get permission from the king to hang him, 
and then you can skip like a bunny to the meeting. Be happy, be cheerful, be glad, because you're going to kill Mordecai. So here he enters in the middle of his grand plan. I, I know it's wrong, but I see in my head him skipping in. Woo! <laughs> so the king says, who's in the court? Haman had just entered into the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And by the way, he had to get the king's permission because Mordecai was a very high-ranking official in the king's court. And the king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, who would the king delight to honor more than me? <laughs> now remember, he's on his way, skipping merrily along, giddy with anticipation and excitement that the king's going to grant him the request to kill Mordecai. He's got this whole plan put out. Yay me, it's going to happen. And now the king wants to honor someone? Who else would it be but me? Of course it's me. <laughs> Wow. And Haman answered the king. For the, now, by the way, this is pretty well thought out. I would suggest this isn't the first time Haman thought of this. I would suggest this is the first time he's got to say it in public. Say it out loud. This is the first time he let it fall out. Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor... Let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on his head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man who the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the square, city square, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> Now, like I said, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. Haman's plan to honor himself was not original or even new. Let's look at the origin of Haman's plan. Hold your finger here and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 12. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Now, it might seem a bit of a far stretch to jump from Haman to distant past, but after we read this, I don't think you'll find that quite such a stretch. Isaiah 14, 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Satan's plan here was to exalt himself and get glory and honor. They said, I will ascend into heaven. God's throne room. His dwelling place. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Not God himself, but above the creations of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, the place of authority. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Satan said, I will sit beside God just like God. I will be like the most high. The honor and the worship and the praise that is due to him and him alone I'm going to get me some of that. I deserve it. I'm going to get it. God says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. You see, Satan, from the beginning, from his fall, his plan has been get glory and honor for yourself. In Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2, you don't have to turn there. You can if you want, but I'll read it. Revelation 6, 1 and 2, we see 
God's plan unfolding during the tribulation period, and we see someone enter. Revelation 6, verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. This is Satan. This is the Antichrist. This is the beast. Doing a Jesus Christ interpretation. And it is so good and so convincing that even today, a vast amount of biblical scholars confuse this guy for Jesus Christ. We see later on in Revelation, Jesus Christ appears on his horse with his name written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. This is not the guy in Revelation 6. You see, Satan always wants to intimidate God. He always wants to receive the worship and praise that God is due by any means necessary. Any way he can get it, he'll take it by trickery by force, by falsehood, by lying. He doesn't care as long as he gets it. And during the tribulation, Satan sets up what's called an unholy trinity. You see, Satan is a great faker. I mean, he's, he's an awesome copycat. He's not very original, but he's always attempting to imitate and mimic the things of God with the things of his own. And so he sets up an unholy trinity, which is Satan, who's physically inhabiting the beast, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the image who causes all, both great and small, who don't accept the mark of the beast and by implication to worship him to be killed. You see, he does everything possible to look like God. We know God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Satan is setting up his own kingdom, the beast, the false prophet, and the image. He's a cheap imitator. But as I said, he's also one of God's tools in God's toolbox. Because God is allowing us to see what happens in his absence. When man says, God, leave me alone, eventually God will say, okay. If you don't want me in the house, this who's coming in. Right? So back to Haman. What does Haman want? His grand plan. He wants the man whom the king would honor to be arrayed in royal robes that the king has worn. And I would infer that the king has worn in public so everyone knows that these are the king's robes. Let there be no mistake that this person is being honored in the royal robes which the king himself has worn. <laughs> Just like the king. He wants to be seated on a royal war horse symbolizing authority, power, and the ability to conquer, just like the king. He wants the war crown or the war crest on the horse, so there's no mistaking his awesomeness, just like the king. And he wants paraded through the city to fanfare and public acclaim, just like the king. You know, Haman might as well have said, I will be like the Most High. What we see Haman doing is what we see his father, the devil, doing from the beginning. Haman's plan is straight out of the devil's playbook. First page, right at the top. Glory to me! The plan is titled 1A. Glory to me. Everything the devil does says, see also, plan 1A, glory me. Every direction he goes, See also, plan 1A, glory to me. This is what Haman's doing. This is what he wants. He wants glory for himself. Can you imagine his excitement and his joy right now? Hmm. His plan to destroy the enemies, the Jews, has been endorsed by the king. Got the stamp of approval. That's going to happen. And he's going to get immensely rich in the process. Glory to me and riches to me. Yay. Only he was invited to the queen's banquet with the king. His gallows had been prepared for Mordecai, that hateful Jew that just won't bow and tremble before him. All he needs is one word from the king, and Mordecai's done. 
And now surely the king will honor and glorify him even more. What could be better? <laughs> Back to Esther 6, verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. <laughs> and just so he didn't miss the point, leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Wow. And by implication, Haman's going to need to do this with gusto. <laughs> He's not going to be able to take this horse and these things and say, yeah, yeah, grumble, grumble. No. Everything that he wanted for himself, the king is going to expect that he does that with gusto to honor the man whom the king has chosen to honor. <laughs> And an interesting point here, we've said all along that Mordecai didn't proclaim his Jewishness at the beginning of the book. At some point, it went public. Right now, the king knows exactly who Mordecai is. Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Now, I'm not certain when the king realized. He might have realized when it was told to him that Mordecai was in sackcloth and ashes and wouldn't come into the palace. But you can bet he knows now. And the king himself has signed his death warrant. I wonder what's going through the king's heart. What's going through his head? Here's this man that I want to honor above all because of everything he's done for me, yet I've signed his death warrant. Hmm. Verse 11. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> you can laugh. That's hilarious. Well, and afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. Now, for days, the people of God had been covered in sackcloth and ashes, mourning and grieved, heartbroken, desperately seeking for their life and their salvation. All the while, their enemy, Haman, had been parading around like a peacock, proud and arrogant, self-proclaimed and self-delusional. And now, in one instant, the roles are reversed. Proud Haman hurries home with his head covered, mourning, while Mordecai is exalted in the presence of the king, according to the king's command, according to the king's will. Mordecai is exalted. Mordecai's day has come. Mordecai's reward has been presented. He no longer has that problem. There's still some problems he's facing, but that was not one of them. How many times through the millennium, millennia has Satan been just like this? Parading around like a peacock because he got one over on God, all the while waiting for the other shoe to drop. When he deceived Adam, excuse me, deceived Eve, and convinced Adam his thought, I'll destroy man whom God has created, whom man loves. Yea, me, I did it. Peacock time. And then God shows up and said, I will send a deliverer who will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. <sighs> so we have a new plan. All right, I'll pollute the bloodline so God can't send this Messiah. And so he pollutes the bloodline of mankind on the whole earth forces God to destroy them all, except Noah and his family. So God has him build a boat. Mr. Peacock gets smacked down again. Then we had the Tower of Babel. Satan gathers them all together in one language of one mind and one heart to build a tower that will reach the heavens, basically saying, we will be like the Most High. We will not be dispersed. And God shows up. And now we got peacocks speaking all kinds of different languages. Can't even squeak the same anymore. <laughs> Satan attempted to destroy Abraham by telling him, don't do as God had said and leave your friends and family. No, go up river a little bit. Just start that way. Don't really get after it, but make a start. Oh, and by the way, take Lot with you. 
But you know what? God had a plan for that too. Lot himself, righteous Lot, dwelling in Sodom. I'm sure Satan had a plan to destroy him. God showed up, pulled Lot out and said, had his angels say, I can't destroy this place until I remove you from here. Job, look what all Job went through. You talk about a terrible intermission. Man, what Job went through was horrible. And Satan thought. In fact, he told God himself, if you just let me touch him, he'll curse you. Let me take all that he has, he'll curse you to your face. That didn't work. So skin for skin, let me touch him, and he'll curse you to your face. Didn't do it. Didn't do it. Isaac and Ishmael. There's another prime example. The child of the promise, the child of faith, the child of disbelief. I'm certain Satan had thought he had something there. Didn't work out. Esau and Jacob. We all know how that story worked out. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. How about Judah and Tamar? There's an interesting one. We studied that a few months ago. Judah having relations with his daughter-in-law disguised as a prostitute because he wouldn't give his youngest son to her because his other two sons were wicked and God killed him. What what a nightmare. I mean, this is soap opera 101. And you can bet Satan fought in the halls. Oh, and by the way, the Messiah was prophesied to come through the line of Judah. And you can bet in the halls of hell, Satan was parading around like a peacock. Ha <laughs> ha, got him now. And then God showed up. Oh, bummer. How about Joseph? I mean, if you put the plan together to prosper a man, would it have looked anything like the plan God put together for Joseph? Let's make the brothers reject you, throw you in a well, sell you to the Midianites, or drag you off, sell you to someone else, sell you as a slave, promote you in the house, and know, oh, by the way, the house owner's wife, she really digs you. <laughs> so off to jail with you. Prophesy, interpret dreams so that this guy is freed, that guy's head's taken off, and oh, by the way, forget you. You got to cook a little more. Sometimes got to go by. And then finally he's released. When you look at the picture of Joseph, you could not put that together as a human. But how God is going to exalt a man and preserve a nation. King Saul. You can bet Satan thought he had the battle won with the Amalekites that we discussed a couple of weeks ago when Saul didn't follow God's orders. But that didn't happen, did it? It took a long time, but God is winding down that problem right here in Esther. How about Jeconiah or Coniah? When God cursed the bloodline that the Messiah was supposed to come through from Solomon's line, cursed him. No more shall anyone rule from this man sitting on his throne henceforth forever. Satan probably threw a party. Woo, got him now. No king coming. Except God had a bloodline that was coming down through the line of Nathan. Just wait. You'll catch up eventually. <laughs> and the greatest one of all is about the cross. How do you think Satan felt when darkness was over the face of the land from the sixth to the ninth hour? When all of mankind should have known in the heart of their hearts that God, the Creator, has just died on a hill on a wooden cross for my sake. The devil killed God. Or so he thought. He was probably having a peacock moment then. But guess what? The third day's coming. Amen? And we're going to celebrate that. In the next couple of weeks, Palm Sunday, Christ's advent as the king. The resurrection morning when he rose from that grave and burst the ground forth because it couldn't hold him. Satan 
has always had at his plan to get glory for himself. But make no mistake, God has always worked against that plan and against Satan and against those who would participate in it. God does not honor and bless those who seek to honor and glorify themselves. Because glory and honor belong to God, not to man. So I would encourage you, don't be a willing participant in the devil's game plan. And this is to all of us. Because at the bottom of that, at the root of the devil's game plan, it's get what's mine. I'm going to get what's mine, and if God don't give it to me, I'm going to take it. If I don't get the glory and the honor that I think I'm due, Haman is saying, I'm going to take it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get what's mine. Word of caution. If we really, really want to get what's ours, sometimes we'll get it. I can tell you, folks, I don't want to get what's mine. I don't want to get what's coming to me. I don't get what I'm owed. That's not what I want. I want grace and I want mercy. Amen? I'm not screaming for justice because I know justice apart from that cross 2,000 years ago, exactly where that puts me. I want mercy. I want forgiveness. I want grace. I want leniency. I want Jesus. But that has to invade my entire life. It's not just my eternal salvation that I need to count on God for. I need to be okay when God holds me down. I need to be okay when he lifts me up. I need to be okay if he never does lift me up. You know, as we walk through this life, we because we're human, we suffer with things of jealousy. Well, so-and-so got a promotion. Why didn't I? I deserve that much more. <laughs> Maybe I did. But it's not mine to give. It's not mine to give. Well, why did so-and-so get this new thing? I wanted one. If you belong to the king, it's not yours to give and it's not yours to take. If you have given yourself to Christ, you've been bought with a price. You are not your own. Everything you do, everything you receive comes from your king. If God exalts us, we'll praise his name. If God holds us down for the intermission period, we'll praise his name. Whatever comes and whatever doesn't come, we need to praise his name. Otherwise, we begin to play the devil's playbook and try to take what doesn't belong to us. And it might sound like a broken record where we've been for several months, but replacement theology and dominion theology, dominion now theology, is basically the same thing. Replacement theology says that God, who has made thousands of promises to the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, within a geographical border to 12 tribes of Israel, to the people of Israel, thousands of promises to them, God is not able to do that. And therefore, all of those promises now belong to us. That's not true. We don't get what he promised them. And so the church can be jealous. Uh, I think some of these theologies have come from a jealous position from the church. A lot of them lack of my understanding from the word, but some of it, I believe, is from a position of jealousy. We want what they have. But I have to tell you, folks, we lack nothing. We have nothing to be jealous of. We are the bride of Christ. We are heirs and joint heirs with him of all things that are his. We have nothing to be jealous of. We lack nothing. Our eternal destiny is beyond belief. We don't need to seek something that's not our own. We need to seek Jesus. Amen. Let God's word be true. Let God's word speak truth. Know who we are in Christ and rest in that. Amen. Proverbs 25, 6 and 7, most of us, I'm sure, are familiar. It says, do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king and do not stand in the place of the great. For it's better that he say to you, come up here, than you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. 
you know, I'm mindful of, of some actors that I've seen. A couple names come to mind, but I'm going to say, who have said things like, man, when I get to heaven, God's got some explaining to do. When I see God, man, he's got some explaining to do. And I think of Proverbs 25, 6 and 7. Man stomps into the throne room. God, you got a thing or two. Here I am, my position of greatness. And the king will say, depart from me. I never knew you. We don't enter into God's presence demanding to be recognized for our greatness. We enter into his presence with honor and with glory, recognizing his greatness and his presence. And if he chooses to move us to the front, he does so. If he chooses to leave us at the back, he does so. This is all metaphorically, right? You get my point here? Haman did not understand this concept. Back to Esther 6, verse 13. And when Haman told his wife Zeresh and all of his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men, now they're wise. They weren't quite so brilliant, you know, last night, but now they're wise. His wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, against him, but will surely fall before him. So now they get the point? Better late than never, I guess. So what do you think has happened to Haman's joy? <laughs> I imagine it's pretty squashed. An exact opposite to Mordecai. Mordecai, who had seen the proclamation and the law signed, and the gallows which Haman had built. I wouldn't be surprised if Haman even put his name on it. So Haman, what you got here? I call it the Mordecai. <laughs> Mor Haman was pretty proud of the fact that he was going to kill and destroy Mordecai. Mordecai knew that. But now Mordecai's redemption is coming to pass. His mourning is being turned into gladness and joy. And Haman's arrogance and joy is being turned into sorrow. And now his wife and his wise men have said, if this Mordecai is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail upon him. Shame they couldn't have talked to him a while back this way. Hmm. And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Which reminds us again, Regardless of Haman's self-proclaimed power, his magnificence, he was still a servant and a pawn of the king. He had to come and go at the whim of the king. He wasn't all that he thought he was, just like Satan wasn't all that he thought he was when he rebelled against God and thought he would go take a seat beside him. Scoot over, God. Let me make some room. Come on, let me smell my room. He's still a tool. He's still a pawn in God's plan. Unlike those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are not tools. We are not pawns. We are children of the King. Amen. As we take communion today, we're reminded that Jesus Christ is the ultimate antithesis, the polar opposite of Satan's game plan. Glory me. 1A. Get glory for me now at all costs. The elders are coming. Because you see, Jesus, who had glory, who had honor, who had renown, he's God eternal forever, the creator, lacked nothing. He gave that up and set it aside to come and give his body and pour out his blood on behalf of us. Okay. And so as we take these elements, let's take a few minutes and pray and thank the Lord with grateful hearts knowing that 
without Christ, we can do nothing. And that includes have the right motivations. That includes being conformed into the image and likeness of Christ. We need the Holy Spirit to do that. We need that washing of the word. We need prayer. We need, we need intimate fellowship with God to continue to shake off and burn off the plans of the enemy, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These things have to go. And they can only go through being conformed to the image and likeness of Christ.